Welcome back everybody. Time for some more fun. Back on the weekend shift. Had a nice rest, but time to go to work. That was gonna be sunny today. All of a sudden, it started drizzling. <laughs> go figure. Anyway, should be still fun. Let's go. Time for adventure. Welcome back everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Let's go at it. Another fun adventure. A common question that always gets asked is how do I get assigned to the aircraft that I work on? Well, at our particular station, I actually don't get assigned aircraft. I get assigned to the gate. So in this particular instant, I'm assigned to an international gate. So that means anything that comes into international, me and my team are responsible for. This is why you see the variety of aircraft that I work on. Even before we are assigned our workload, our crew chiefs and managers will have a crew briefing and make sure to go over what's going on with the workload. They assess the situation, they give us a safety briefing, make sure everything is a-okay, and then we go out there and get it done, make it airworthy. So without further ado, my first aircraft is a 787 out in international. Let's go. Let's go. It's got to give it a little bit of oil. Not the usual. Oil it. But here's a fun one for you. You know that there's a little tab right there that prevents oil from escaping. This little tab is right there. Just in case, let's say the oil cap was damaged or missing or came off, it prevents the oil from spewing out of the oil tank. There's also a little screen right there, as you can see. This is to prevent any kind of debris or big debris to fall inside the oil tank. Now, boy, oh boy, do I got a story for you. And I managed to actually catch it on camera. This was a while back. It's an old story. That little screen broke off and fell inside the oil tank. And here it is. I was just simply servicing engine oil when I popped this thing off and I noticed inside, I was like, oh, wait a minute, something is missing. Yep, and it was the screen. It fell off inside the tank. We had to take off the whole cover right here. After about 30 minutes of trying to fish it out with a magnet, didn't work. We had to drain the whole tank. Finally, with some mechanical fingers, I managed to get it out. Got a new cap right there, installed it, filled it back up. Yeah, that was a headache. Oh, in case you were wondering, yes, the engines do have a debris monitoring system. It's an air oil separator that removes air from the engine scavenge oil. It also acts as a particle separator. A particle separator basically collects any kind of particle contamination and then sends it to the sensors to let them know there you got stuff in the engine. That's not good. On our last adventure, I showed you guys a particular component, the little seal that's at the bottom of the lower beacon on the 787. But here it is in action, you know, the beacon going off. It's pretty cool to see. It's a very high intensity light. As you can see, these things are LED lights. They are also programmed very smartly. It knows that it's coming to the end of its life cycle. It'll start flashing in a particular manner when it reaches close to about 40,000 hours of serviceable life. So if you ever see a 787 with a beacon that's flashing a bit odd, it, that means that it knows that its life is almost over. And it also designates for us as maintenance that we need to change it out. As always, performing a simple walk around and check. Um, the brakes, I think I've mentioned this before, on a 787, the brakes are electric. Here's a nice look at the undercarriage of the truck. Into a beautiful day after all. Let's take a look at the 787 nose landing gear. The two big cylinders that you're seeing there are the nose steering actuators. This is what moves the nose gear left to right. By the way, if you didn't know, the 787 runs on a 5,000 PSI hydraulic system. Pretty incredible. The two little lights that you're seeing there is to designate the functioning condition of the brakes. Red means that the brakes are on. Orange means that the brakes are set. And there's another little light right below it, which illuminates blue. That means the brakes are off. This is mostly for the ground crew gives them the visual cue of understanding what condition the aircraft brakes are in. Up next, we have this little component right here on the left side of the nose wheel well. This is an accumulator and it's charging port. The 787 actually has four accumulators, one for the left system, one for the right system, and one for the center system. This is to maintain the pressurization of the bootstrap reservoir. Fancy word of putting pressure on top of the reservoir to keep positive pressure. 
This one that you're looking at in particular is a, another extra redundancy. The center system nose landing gear pressure system contains an additional accumulator to reduce the pressure spikes. These things are usually pre-charged to about 2000 PSI and they are charged with nitrogen. Up there, you're gonna see the nose wheel stoppers, the little brakes, that's about it. All right, here she is, Plastic Princess. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's been listening to the news lately about this little switch, right? Apparently this is what caused that Latam incident. Okay, let's talk about it. Did you notice the first thing right there? How slow that chair is, how slow it moves? That thing is slow as molasses. So let's just go with what they were saying. They're saying somebody inadvertently either pressed the switch or the switch itself, the rocker switch was malfunctioning, which there's a video circulating that it's moving on its own. Let's say even if that was the case. Now, the pilot or the first officer, whoever it happened to, let's say the chair started inadvertently moving forward. Do you think they will not notice something moving them forward, especially at that rate of speed, slow speed, whether they had any kind of tray of food in front of them or anything else? Do you think they would not have just not touched the controls? They can still have space to back up. Second of all, these chairs have a kill switch. Look right there on the inboard side, inboard side of the captain and the first officer. There's a power cutoff switch. Pilots are trained for this. They know where that switch is. If they feel that chair is malfunctioning, they can turn that switch into off position and it will kill all electrics to the seat. And they have manual reversion so they can readjust their seat manually. Well, in my mind, to hear somebody saying just because the seat moved forward and the pilot knocked into the control column causing the autopilot to disengage, which is true if you push the column it will disengage the autopilot. It just sounds a bit preposterous. By the way, the 777 also has the same type of kill switch right there. I'll show it to you later in the videos. Now, I'm not blaming the pilots. I'm not blaming anything else. I'm not even blaming Boeing here. It's just the situation is very odd. One thing I will guarantee is that the only thing or only system that does know what exactly happened within that flight deck is the flight deck voice recorder. Until they pull that up and actually make it public, that'll be some time. But just from a maintenance standpoint and understanding how that chair actually functions and the ability to stop the chair from functioning and the rate of speed that the chair moves, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's either that or human error, lack of situational awareness where the pilot does not notice or understand that they are being moved forward inadvertently and does not take you know action to it so it just doesn't make sense to me but that's my take on it i'm giving you the maintenance perspective and the functionality of the chair itself so you understand what it can do and what it cannot do and just from a human being's perspective where if i am being pushed forward inadvertently i'm going to stop myself because i notice i'm being pushed inadvertently forward i hope this makes sense again i'm not blaming anybody here but hopefully they'll figure out what what actually occurred within that flight deck Good news is they recovered, everybody landed, few injuries, but no, no, nothing's too serious. But anyway, moving on, let's go. Next office.
I bet you didn't know brake assemblies were made in Iran. I'm just joking around, guys. I'm just messing around. It's an acronym. It stands for Inspect Repair as Necessary. Brake assemblies or many other components that get overhauled and reassembled, they put a sticker like this from the manufacturer. Obviously, this one is from Goodrich Corporation. It means a official inspection stamp, basically. Inspected and repaired as necessary. Almost had you go in there, didn't I? <laughs> And we're back in a triple seven. This one actually stays here, goes out later tonight. But you know, I showed you guys earlier on the 787, the, the C, you know, it's got a button right here. Well, the triple seven is a little different. Actually, the C controls are right here. See? Up and down, back and forth. But this aircraft also as well as the 787 has a stop switch right there you can power it off just like that the 787 seat also has this see both sides here i'll show you how it works look the electrical systems are working on a chair right now i'm going to disengage it right here all i gotta do is put the power off watch no more electrics disengaging but there's a manual reversion. I'm just gonna turn the power back on to show you that you can get it back into functioning mode right there. As I said, this is a 777, but the 787 is exactly the same way. And here's the manual functionality. You have functionality for recline. One for vertical, meaning seat going up and down. And another one for forward and backwards right there i think we're done talking about seats we beat this horse to death anyway a little bit of downtime we went to cargo side check out what i saw as always cargo never disappoints Well, it wouldn't be a stick shift if I didn't show you some cool cars, and this beautiful McLaren definitely did the job. Absolutely gorgeous. I'm sure this thing costs in the millions. At this point, these modern day supercars are mimicking aircraft design. Look at the aerodynamic properties just on the body. You're doing 200 miles per hour plus, yeah, you wanna stay on the ground, hence the downforce designs. What is this thing? All right, you guys, here you go. There's your assignment. You tell me what this thing is, because I have no clue. First time seeing this type of car. To be honest with you, almost looks like a uh, classic uh, Soviet Chaika, but obviously it's not. It's got an Italian flag on it. It is a beautiful car, though. Check out this interior. Incredible. Beautifully restored or maintained. Now this thing I'm very familiar with. This is the Toyota Corolla GR, and this is pretty much the most expensive Toyota Corolla you can ever buy. This thing can range up to almost $50,000. Yeah, this is a race car. To be more specific, it's meant for a rally. This little hatchback Corolla can go up to 300 horsepower. Yeah, this thing is awesome. And another Porsche. This is a special one. I've never seen a one like this.
Yeah, this thing was definitely something special. It is very beautiful and the custom design. CSF911. You guys let me know. I have never seen this company before. I'm sure it's another modification company for this Porsche. You know, I enjoy all facets of aviation, especially when it comes down to corporate jets. Don't get me wrong. I am not very knowledgeable when it comes down to the mechanics of it, but aesthetic wise, I love it. They are beautiful jets. I believe this is a, a Global Express and that paint job is absolutely gorgeous. That is unique. Well, that was a nice easy day. Hope you guys had fun. I'll see you guys here bright and early in the morning. Don't forget the coffee. Later. And we're back. Come on, let's go. Round two. Time to clock in. Another question you guys tend to ask within the comments as you see me go home at night when it's dark and you see me come back to work when it's still dark because I work 16 hour shifts. And yes, that is legal. There's still sufficient amount of time in between to rest. I choose to work these kind of shifts. I pick up shifts and I can give away shifts. It's a very flexible environment when it comes down to airline work, but it wasn't always like this. It took me a long time to get onto these shifts because I needed to have seniority. But he that's ever worked in an airline industry knows exactly what I mean. Seniority rules over everything when it comes down to being where you are or what shift you're on. Spent better half of my career in the beginning, about 14 years on night shift. I don't regret it. I love it. Loved every single moment of it. But the end goal was to get off of night shift. And as for days off, yeah, forget about that. I still have Monday, Tuesday off after 20 years of seniority. <laughs> Enjoy that one. Weekends, holidays, yeah, those things don't matter to me. It's just another day. We keep on working. First office. Let's go. Let's see what we got. Just gotta wait for the APU to finish powering up and get the generators online. You know what's funny about the 737 and the evolution of it? Sometimes you can see the older uh, generation of aircraft still within the newer ones. Like right here. Obviously, this is an 800 and it's still got the classic steam gauges on certain systems. But some of them, like for example, the older, let's say the 200s or the 100s, they're actually gauges right here as well. Because you can see the cutouts. These actually used to be uh, AC amp gauges and right above that they also had two more gauges this was a little further up these were for the generator oil temperature gauges well they used to be right here two circles but now it's gone because they don't need them anymore but yeah but the cutouts are still there that's pretty cool anyway <laughs> nice little trivia for you but yeah pretty cool you, you get to see the evolution of the airplane fun here you go that's what it looks like that's a dash 200 Classic version with the JTAD engines. We used to call those things the cigar sticks. Loud as heck and always leaking oil. Well, looks like it's turning to a beautiful day. Let's see. That's the ground power receptacle. There's your little light switch right here. Turns on that light. No flashlight needed. And this one's even upgraded. Got the new LED. Looking good. I'll still use a flashlight though. All right, guess where we are? We are in the forward cargo pit of the 737-800, and this gives me the opportunity to talk about the Alaska cargo door open incident, which was not a big deal at all. But of course, Media gets a hold of it. They have to blame Boeing. You have to blame this and that and everybody else in between. But let me explain to you how this works. The 737 cargo doors are plug style doors. What that means is that they open inwards. Mentioned this before, cargos are pressurized. When aircraft is pressurized and it's a plug style door, the door seals itself. Imagine you fill the bathtub full of water and you had a plug to hold the water. The plug is a door. 
The water is the air pressure inside the aircraft. Make sense? Mechanism to open and close a door is a spring latch as well as cables and pulleys. It's a classic aircraft. A very rudimentary and simple design, but very effective and works well. There's a handle. The handle goes to a spring. The spring goes to a cable, an actual physical cable that is routed via pulleys and goes to various latches. Well, two of them to be specific, one on each side of the cargo door. I'll show you the actual locking mechanisms themselves. Let's see what they reported. Cargo door opens in flight. Aircraft lands with a cargo door open. Glamorization of absolutely nothing. Cannot stand media nowadays because they don't know what they're talking about. There's the latch I'm talking about. And that cargo door was probably closed the whole time right up until the aircraft actually touched down. Can guarantee you the pilots even got a notification within the flight deck because there is a cargo door open sensor. That door was closed the whole time right up until it probably touched down on the ground. And the only reason it opened is probably one of those latches probably failed. But when it was in flight, when the aircraft was pressurized, no problems at all because that door was sealed perfectly. Interestingly enough, they reported that there were animals within that cargo and the animals were completely fine. Do you know why? Because the cargo door never opened in flight. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, these things are machines. These are mechanisms. Things break down time to time. There are redundancies. Safety features are designed to make sure it's safe even when things fail. I really hope you guys understand how safe aircraft are. Moving on. I noticed one of our tugs right here and it's always interesting to see the ground equipment. And this is a Challenger 150 and look at the ratings on this thing. I am always fascinated by any kind of machinery that is basically heavy duty. I found really fascinating is this little placard right here. Look at the torque on the lug nuts. That's more than an aircraft. Jumped on a tug with one of our ramp personnel and hitched the ride to watch the bird push out. And I tell you what, this was one of the most beautiful pushbacks I've ever seen. Look at this performance. This is absolutely incredible. And pay attention. This is a camera that is pointing from the right. So don't worry, he is not crossing the line. It might look like the tow bar is crossing the line, but it's actually not. So... Don't worry, the unemployment line is not being crossed. I'm paying attention and so is the driver and I'm not disturbing him at this point. So he is totally focused, but this was a beautiful pushback and watch how accurately he puts it on the line. This was beautiful. Anyway, I'll shut up. You guys enjoy this one.
After all undone, successful pushback, aircraft getting dispatched, we're all happy. On to the next airplane, let's go! I can never get enough of this engine. It's absolutely gorgeous. Let's check the oil real quick. Wait a minute. That's interesting. That's a new design. That's a brand new. Huh? I've never seen this before. Now here, look, now you see the difference? This is on the other engine. I don't know, the other one must be modified or some kind of a different design. This one is slightly different. It's pretty cool. I love seeing stuff like this. Like I said, evolution of the airplane. You, you get to watch it basically change right before your eyes. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, oils are good. Back into an Airbus. See, these got electric controls too. We check the engine oils downstairs, but over here you have to energize the EECs for to actually show over here. So you'd have to come up over here. It's only on these Neos that it's like that. Well, the, the Fadex. You have to energize them. There you go. And then just the rest, the standard. Check hydraulics, make sure everything else is good. No status messages, which is normal. That's exactly what I want to see. Good. Right before I left, uh, it looks like I noticed it on a corner of my eye. I was like, I thought I was going crazy. Look what the pilot left me. A nice little message. Good jet. That's right, it's a good jet. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. You know, I think I've shown you guys the circuit breaker panels on the Airbus, but I don't think I've ever shown you what it looks like behind. Check this out. Yeah, I think you're gonna enjoy this. There's a little clip right here. There you go. Look at this. How beautiful is that? That's what you call superb wire management. Gorgeous. What it looks like behind the circuit breakers right there. A couple of relays over here. And just a bunch of wiring. It basically looks exactly the same behind all of these up here and up here. Oh yeah. Pretty cool example. 
how beautifully they build these airplanes. So much attention to detail. Absolutely fantastic. That's about it. We're all good here. This one actually turns around and goes right back out to Miami. So I already checked everything. It's good to go. It's a good airplane. Just like the sign says over there. <laughs> all right, on to the next office. Next office. Back to the wide bodies. Just came in from Heathrow. Here we go. I already checked the parameters. Everything's good to go. Engine oils are good. Let's see. Status good. No issues, no problems. Fantastic. There was one little write-up. I think they said something was stuck in a seat. Let's go check it out. Let's see. We're looking for 26D. Somebody said they dropped. You believe it or not hand sanitizer down the armrest where the tray table lives. So with these seats that are up front, up against the bulkhead, the tray tables are inside the armrest like this, right? So, like that. They said they couldn't stow the arm, the tray table back in. There it is. <laughs> oh, now I gotta fish that out. That oh, should be fun. I forgot my mechanical fingers, but I do have two screwdrivers. Ah. Maybe I can slide it up. Come on. You know what? I got an idea. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I win. I think a little screwdriver and a tape can't fix. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it's actually nice, it's not that bad. Yeah, it definitely gives a nice illumination and everything. Nice, nice throw and nice general broad throw as well. So I like it.
this is the CFM 56-7B equipped on the 737 and I'm looking here at the hot section and right here is the cold section or the high bypass. But one thing I want to pay particular attention to is right up top. Look what it says right there. It says cooling hole right there. There's one on either side. This is for cooling the thrust reverser sleeve duct. As you know, the core of the engine gets very hot and there are also insulation blankets on the inner core. What these holes will do is basically equalize temperature and breathe out any kind of humidity or heat that is in between those heat blankets. Funny thing is that you won't even find this in the aircraft maintenance manual. It is some kind of a service bulletin that was done for this engine. A quick look at the interior. I always like checking this little thing out. It's a uh, Grimes incandescent floodlight. Fancy way of saying it's a utility light. That's all it is. But I remember somebody asking and somebody said, Stig, what are those things right there? Little tabs right next to that compartment. Well, these things are for the pilots to hang their ties and hats off of. That's all it is for. All right. That's, that's it. This is the last flight of the night. All I have to do is just really oil this one, and this one's gonna go off to the hangar. But yeah, not much else for today. It was a fun day. Hope you guys had fun, and I'll see you bright and early in the morning. Later. Good morning, everybody. Woo, look at that. That's gonna be a beautiful sunrise. Let's go. Time to have some more fun. One more day. Don't ever be scared to stop time to time and just absorb the beauty of the world that's around you. Get all in and appreciate everything around you. And we're back inside of a triple seven. There you go. Oh, this one's ready to go to Dallas here in a little bit. This came up, making sure all the parameters are okay. She's good to fly. I can't remember who was asking me. I think somebody noticed something on the floor and, or in the, in, over here in the flight deck. I said, Stig, what are those little things right there? These little solar caps. You see those? Well, pretty much all 777s have this and uh, some are covered by carpet. Some are covered with these little plates. What's underneath there is a tiny little hole. And what we would do during maintenance, let's say for a flight control, we would stick a very long rig pin. It's a pin that locks out flight controls. That's all it's for. We'll just remove that little panel, put a pin in there to lock out flight controls to perform maintenance or rigging. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, this one's good to go. On to the next one. Somebody asked one time, how do you know where to park the airplanes or how to designate where they are? Well, everything is marked on the ground. Pilot is using the guidance system or somebody is marshalling them in. They know where to stop the aircraft because everything is marked on the ground. Notice how there's a variety of aircraft that can park there. This is determined by the length of the aircraft. You don't want it too far in and you don't want it too far out. Basically, most importantly, you don't want it too far out because you don't want the tail sticking out into the taxiway. This is an Airbus 321 and on the tail section, right up there, I want to show you something. A remnants of an old system. You see that right there? That used to be an antenna. This was part of an old internet system or the old Wi-Fi called GoGo. -Go. They had a transmitter and a receiver up front. Obviously, the antenna is no longer there. They've removed it, but it, because it's an old system, it wasn't really good. It still used ground antennas. It was very slow. 
Nowadays, aircraft are more modernized and they're using satellite link. Companies such as Viasat now provide satellite communication as well as internet. And the aircraft now are equipped with a big dome up top, right there. So if you were wondering what that big dome is on top of most aircraft you see, that's what it is. That's a satellite antenna for your Wi-Fi. The little fin behind it is your ELT antenna. Back into an Airbus. Woo. Came in a little bit of a hot brakes there. Cool that down. Turn on the annoying brake fans. There it goes. It'll cool back. It'll cool back off quick. This particular 321 is equipped with the V2500 engines. It's a very special backup feature or function. It's called N1 mode. Since the V2500 is heavily influenced by Rolls-Royce design, it runs off of EPR, engine pressure ratios. Now in normal situations, the aircraft, or the engine I should say, is controlled by the FADAC, full authority digital engine control. But that means in this aircraft that the pilots almost never have to touch the throttle body. The pilots will just set the thrust to a certain detent and the computer will take care of everything. They will never have to even touch it in flight. Now, let's say it went into a degraded mode. It lost input from the FADAC. Now the pilots can manually control the aircraft or the thrust. They can press that button and now the N1 will determine the range of thrust and the pilot has to manually adjust the thrust. So again, another safety feature, redundancy. Picking up some equipment from the hangar and we drove by and this thing was on the trailer. Holy cow, that's a heck of an armored vehicle right there. Anybody know what that is? You tell me. The aircraft came in with a couple of discrepancies. One was a seat recline that wasn't functioning. The passenger reported that the seat recline was basically not reclining. I opened it up and this is what it looks like underneath your seat. Well, most of them look like this. There's some different designs, but the concept is the same. The button is routed to a cable and the cable pulls this little lever right here and the lever actuates a hydro lock. That's the cylindrical component that you're seeing. So sometimes the cable gets a little bit twisted and doesn't engage that plunger. Make simple adjustment and the thing was working back to normal. We got him with an airplane. All righty, let's go. Got a call from my crew chief and they let me know we got to reposition this aircraft from international to a domestic gate. So I went upstairs to the flight deck and I'm going to brake ride this aircraft. But first we got to set up the frequencies and because we have to ask permission from tower to reposition. Working with radio management panels and audio management panels is fairly simple. Desired frequency, put on the VHF1 or VHF2, whichever frequency you're working on and use proper etiquette and communication skills. In the beginning, if you're new to this, it's very intimidating to talk to the tower. When communicating with tower, this is the things that you have to say. Who you're calling, who you are, where you are, and what do you want to do? Let's use this as an example. Los Angeles ground, this is Stig 777 Alpha at gate 159, requesting aircraft reposition under tow to gate 41. At that point, the tower will come back to me and say, Stig 777 Alpha, pushback approved, tail west or east, whichever way they want to tell you to push, proceed to the gate. At that point, I will talk to the driver of the tug, tell them brakes are released, okay to push, and also let them know which direction to push into. If there was traffic in the alley, they would just simply say, wait for company to pass through, then push back approved.
all said and done, we set the brakes, turn off hydraulics, provide a tower that we successfully made the move, and then call for a jet bridge operator so we can get off the airplane. But yeah, that's about it. But it's even more fun when you're taxiing. At that point, you're not handling the radios, you're driving, and the person next to you is handling the radios. Guess what? We're changing brake. Let's see. Yeah, it's pretty flush. It's going to Nashville. Might as well change it today. Now <laughs> we got to change it. Install the gear pins and get it going. Should be fun. I wanted to capture the whole process, but I just didn't have the right setup. So I just took a few clips here and there. You still get to see kind of cool stuff right here. That right there is the brake temperature sensor. That's the cannon plug we have to remove. And the big bar, the link right there that you see, that actually holds the brake from rotating. It's an anti-rotation link. Interestingly enough, uh, this is a RII process, which means a required inspection item. Any Boeing that has this type of setup for a brake that has an anti-rotation bar, it requires an inspection process. The brake itself is a carbon ceramic brake. We always mess up and say carbon fiber for some reason, just old habits. But, but they are carbon ceramic brakes. Line on top, that's the hydraulic line. That actually feeds hydraulic pressure into the brake. After the wheel assembly has been removed, we put it off to the side because we're gonna reuse that same wheel. The tire on the wheel is still serviceable and still good to go, so we don't need to change it. But here's a nice look at the key slots as well as the thermal fuse plugs right there. These are the things that actually melt if the brake over temps. It will release the tire pressure to prevent an explosion. Also a nice look at the tie bolts and the inner bearing. That is what rides on the axle. Here's the other side of it. This is the outer bearing. Just doing a quick little inspection, making sure everything's okay. The seals are good. It's properly greased. There's that link I was telling you about that connects to the brake assembly itself. Once it's removed and all the lines are removed and the thread protector is installed, now we can remove the brake assembly itself. The brake assembly also has an inner sleeve that sometimes comes off with the brake. I'll show you that in a second. But before we reinstall, we have to inspect all the areas and re-lubricate. Mind you, we're following a maintenance manual procedure, so everything is step by step. The process usually takes about 40 to 50 minutes. And that's not including the paperwork. The paperwork is, uh, yeah, that's a whole other story. This aircraft had plenty of ground time, so we just took our time. There you go. That's that inner barrel sleeve that I was talking about. Same thing with this one. Gets clean, relubricated, inspected. And basically the process goes in reverse. Put the new brake assembly on, relubricate the areas. Install the hydraulic line, installed the brake temperature sensor, the anti-rotation link. The inspector did his job and concurred and gave us a thumbs up. There also has to inspect the, the inner barrel sleeve I told you about. After that, we put the wheel assembly back on, put on the main axle nut, torque everything down properly, install the tire pressure sensor, and take it off the jacks. Now time for paperwork. And that's that. New brake. Good to go. All in day's work. All right, guys, that's about it for this week. I hope you guys all had fun, and I'll see you all next week on the next adventure. Later! Well, that's about it, guys. This wraps it up for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for being here, as always. I appreciate your time and effort to watch and listening to my uh, endless ramblings. Don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm always here for you. I'll respond to you. i doing my best to catch up on all the comments. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you all on the next adventure. Later!